Dirk, welcome back to our program. Uh, Christian, thanks so much for having me. So we talked to you a lot over the years when you were all sorts of different iterations of, of envoy, presidential envoy, basically ISIS point man over the last many, many years. Um, you have resigned, and it was a very public letter and a public moment. But I want to ask you first the consequences of the U.S. pullout. And we hear today that the Turkish president has decided and has offered to be you know, the security force for Manbij, that famous town uh, in northern Syria. What, are, what does that mean? Is that a good thing? Should the U.S. be happy that the Turks are going to take over? When we formed the coalition, um, really in late summer, early fall of 2014, uh, we started with about 12 countries. It's grown to 75 countries. Um, American leadership was really critical to that. Um, and of course, Turkey was a was a key partner in this. And, and our our initial uh, plan, plan A, if you want to say that, um, was to work with Turkey uh, to get a handle on this problem. And I probably spent most of my time in the first year of my job, um, including when I was working with General Allen, uh, most of our time was spent in Accra because uh, most of the material coming to, to fuel the ISIS war machine, uh, frankly, was coming across the border uh, from Turkey into Syria. So we, we, we clearly identified that one of the things we wanted to do uh, was to work with the Turks, a NATO ally, uh, to control their border. And quite frankly, uh, it was very frustrating um, because Turkey did not take much action uh, on the border. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have worked very hard with Turkey on, in various ways, and nothing has really worked out. And there's a number of reasons for that, quite frankly. Um, I think our interests in Syria uh, in, in fundamental ways really diverge. And when, um, when President Erdogan puts on the table proposals that might look, look good in concept, um, every time we send our best people, our best planners, to really dig into what can actually we do together, um, it never really pans out. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just give you an example. Um, the opposition groups that Turkey uh, supports um, that it would send, for example, into a safe zone are simply not groups that the United States uh, can really work with. I mean, they are very closely tied with, uh, tied with, with, with extremist groups. And if you just run... Um, if you just look at the northern tier of Syria and just run across what is now the, the Turkey border, um, in Idlib province, that's an area that we don't operate in. It is really an, an area of influence for Turkey. Uh, it is really dominated now uh, entirely by groups uh, with ties to Al Qaeda. All the border crossings with Turkey are controlled by Al Qaeda. Wow, it's a very serious problem. It's a very serious problem. It, it is. It, um, I, I sort of see what you're saying. I mean, you're saying that that is not the solution uh, to replace uh, U.S. troops who are leaving. So let me wind back a little bit this tape to when you first heard that the president was going to be removing U.S. troops from Syria after all the hard-won gains that you described. Well, first, um, we knew that uh, President Erdogan wanted to speak with President Trump, and President Erdogan was uh, saber-rattling about sending uh, the Turkish-backed opposition forces and Turkish military forces into areas of Turkey uh, where U.S. forces are operating. And we had been dealing with this for a couple of months. So our message to Turkey was just, but do not send your military forces in, because that's going to create uh, a, a very serious situation and, frankly, put American lives at risk. So that was the policy. Um, when President Erdogan called uh, President Trump, uh, this was really upended. Instead, uh, uh, President Trump did not say that. Um, and he basically said, uh, look, uh, we plan to leave Syria uh, fairly soon, and uh, then basically a, a green light. So uh, that just totally reversed everything we had been doing for a very long time. Um, I was in Iraq working with the new Iraqi government on, um, on making sure we sustain the very significant gains against ISIS. Uh, when I was informed of the call, I, I, had, a, I had a phone call with Secretary Pompeo, uh, and I came, came home to Washington uh, to try to manage the fallout from this. And I immediately got on the phone with uh, my coalition partners in capitals around the world and tried to explain uh, what was happening. Um, and it was just a total reversal of what we had been telling them mm -hmm. uh, for a number of months. And you did resign. Um, but to be fair, you were going to plan to leave mid-February, but you brought that up to the end of December. And in your letter to your colleagues, you said, the recent decision by the president came as a shock and was a complete reversal of policy that was articulated to us. It left our coalition partners confused and our fighting partners bewildered. Uh, you've explained a little bit uh, about that. But when you say... What, what was your first, what came out of your mouth? What, what was the first thing you said when you got the call that this was going to happen? 
Well, there were two ways to look at it. One was, okay, the president has asked us to leave Syria. Let's try to figure out a way to, uh, to orchestrate this um, in a way that can still achieve all of our objectives in Syria. And all of our objectives in Syria include, and again, this, these are the instructions from, from the White House. So this is not a policy that's just cooked up in the State Department. Um, our policy in Syria, articulated by the White House National Security Advisor John Bolton and others, uh, was that we would stay in Syria until, number one, the enduring defeat of ISIS. That was the primary mission. That was my mission. Number two, uh, we'll stay in Syria until all Iranians are out of Syria. Uh, whether or not that was real realistic, that was the stated policy articulated, again, uh, from the White House. And number three, we would stay in Syria until there was a, an irreversible momentum, uh, was the phraseology, to the UN-backed political process in Geneva, mm -hmm. which dealt with the Assad regime and the civil war. I frankly believe that if we are leaving Syria, as the president has now very clearly instructed, um, those objectives simply are totally unachievable. Another thing that really concerned me, Christian, is that asking a military force to withdraw under pressure or from a combat environment is one of the most difficult things you can ask a military force to do. So if the orders are, and these are the orders from the president to withdraw, that has to be the mission. The mission cannot be withdraw and do a number of other things. Uh, complete the ISIS campaign, which of course we want to do. Uh, keep the Russians and the regime out of the territory we, we now influence. Uh, try to do some sort of engineering to allow Turkey to come in to replace us. Um, and a num number of other things. That's impossible right. uh, to ask the few Americans on the ground to do. So it's really a mission impossible. Well, I mean, it just does sound absolutely awful. And I wonder, before I get into more specifics about the particular fallout that you were just referring to, how does it make you feel? I mean, as a person, as the ISIS point man, now seeing four Americans killed uh, this past week in the days after President Trump made his announcement. Well, look, anyone who works uh, on these issues, we're professional. I've worked across three administrations, Republicans and Democrats. I've worked on policies I fully supported. I worked on policies I might have thought have been unwise, but you always, uh, your voice is at the table and you try to influence things uh, based upon the facts and the analysis uh, and, and you do the best you can. So in Syria, for example, uh, we are not doing the fighting on the ground. Uh, for th over three years in this campaign, until just last week, uh, two Americans had been killed in action. And then tragically last week, uh, we lost four additional Americans. Um, that pales in comparison to the Syrian Democratic Forces that have lost thousands of casualties uh, in this campaign. American taxpayers are not spending money on civilian uh, reconstruction and other types of those tasks. That's coming from the coalition that we built. So it is a very uh, sustainable, low-cost, high-impact uh, mission. And the kind of mission, Brett, let me interrupt you, the kind of mission, presumably, that President Trump would love. You just uttered the magic words, low cost. Other people are paying the bulk of the money that it takes, as you've just described. Well, again, to, to des help design a campaign plan that was succeeding, and that was reaching a really critical phase, and we were talking about the longer-term transition, uh, and to have it all upended in a phone call with a foreign leader without any serious consultation uh, with the national security team, with the Secretary of Defense and others, um, that's just not the way to run foreign policy effectively. So uh, this was a, a, a complete uh, reversal, and I'm, I am concerned about the, the fallout. One can say that the president has a fairly unusual relationship with Russian President Vladimir Putin, and that maybe he doesn't care so much if the Russians fill the void that the U.S. is leaving. But he doesn't have a cozy relationship with the Iranians. And you just said one of the principal aims was to degrade Iranian influence as much as possible, and the stated aim of the White House was to stay until Iran was no longer a viable player there. But Iran is staying, and not only that, the president himself said, well, Iran can have it. You know, we don't want it. It's just sand and death. I don't understand that policy. Do you? Well, Christian, you hit on a good point. And this is, there's a bit of, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be careful with my words, but there's a, li there's a bit of incoherence between the views of uh, the president and the views of some of the most senior members of the national security team, particularly in the White House. Um, uh, the views of the president, clearly, he's, he's been very consistent. He does not want to be uh, overly invested in the Middle East, particularly with, uh, with U.S. military power. Um, the views of the National Security Advisor seem to be quite different. And so that is a divergence that uh, makes our foreign policy, uh, uh, there's, it lends an element of incoherence to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear about this from partners all around the world, and, um, and that's something that ultimately, I think, 
uh, they're going to have to address. But it's still really weird because everything the president has done speaks to wanting to isolate Iran, whether pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal, whether being so cozy with Saudi Arabia despite everything, including the Khashoggi murder, just because they partly see it as a bulwark against Iran. Um, and, then, and then to say that, that it can have it if it wants. We don't want Syria. It's just sand and death. But, you know, you just mentioned being a presidential envoy. You're a presidential envoy for President Trump. Did you ever meet him? Well, uh, you know, every administration is different. So with President Bush, I was in the White House. Uh, if, I, if I wasn't overseas every morning, uh, we were in the Oval Office. President Obama, uh, very regular uh, exchanges. Uh, President Trump just runs the operation differently. So most of my, most of my interactions in the Trump administration were with the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, and our military commanders. I was uh, obviously involved in every major decision of the ISIS campaign. Uh, but in terms of direct interactions with President Trump, he pretty much interacts with his uh, cabinet secretaries. That's so that's a no, basically. The president did not meet the presidential envoy to Syria. Uh, yeah, that's right. Hmm. Are you concerned, as one writer has said, senior fellow at Brookings, the advent of a more unified and predictable U.S. foreign policy is likely to weaken American influence and destabilize the international order? A deeply divided Trump administration was the best case for those who believe in the United States post-war strategy, defined by strong alliances, an open global economy, and broad support for democracy, the rule of law, human rights, all the rest of it. Well, again, I just go back to my earlier point. There is a, there is a disconnect, and I, my, just my own personal experience, um, instructions from the White House, from very senior levels of the White House, uh, to tell our partners, our allies, the Russians, our adversaries, that we are staying in Syria until these very uh, uh, these these objectives are met. For example, until Iran is leaving Syria, um, that those are instructions that we were carrying uh, from the White House, uh, and that was completely reversed by the president. Uh, therefore, I think we have to be re very realistic about the situation in Syria. And number one, um, I think we have to be realistic that uh, President Assad is staying in place. Mm -hmm. uh, this objective that somehow. Uh, we are going to work through a U.N. process uh, to, to remove Bashar al-Assad, I think at this point is unrealistic. And if we, if we continue to reach for unrealistic objectives, U.S. credibility will continue to be further uh, diminished. In other words, Assad wins and he gets it back. He, he wins and he gets pretty much all of Syria back. Well, that's the consequence of our, of our leaving Syria um, and announcing to the world we are leaving Syria. You know, Christian, I also did a lot of negotiations with the Russians on Syria, so I kind of understand exactly where they come from. Those negotiations are very tough. Uh, what gave us leverage at the table was the fact that we are present on the ground and that we have influence over a significant portion of Syria. And we actually drew lines on the map to make clear to the Russians, you do not cross this line or you're going to have uh, a very bad day. That gives, you, that gives you leverage with the Russians. And we are getting to the point uh, where, with the defeat of the physical caliphate, we would be able to sit down with the Russians and have a very serious conversation about the future of Syria. Um, announcing to the world that we are just leaving, uh, basically all of that leverage completely evaporates. And, and just not to put too fine a point on it, the main reason that you stated at the beginning for the U.S. presence and the U.S. campaign and the coalition campaign was to defeat ISIS. And the president described ISIS as defeated, that's a quote, and absolutely obliterated in terms of territory. Um, but of course, you know, many reports released late last year, including the Pentagon Inspector General, the UN, Center for Strategic and International Studies, estimates that ISIS has 20 to 30,000 members in Iraq and Syria. Is, Iraq, is ISIS defeated? Can the president leave Syria knowing that there will be no more threat from ISIS? You know, Christian, it's, look, it's a great question. And in early December, Secretary Mattis and I met with all the military contributors of our coalition, including many countries that have been attacked from ISIS out of Syria. And the unanimous view was that ISIS is not defeated. This mission is not over. Um, I do not think uh, there would be a, a single expert that would walk in the Oval Office and tell the president that uh, this is over. Um, and that is why we always said that the mission was the enduring defeat of ISIS, not just uh, taking away the physical caliphate, but getting the arrangements in place to ensure that a vacuum would not open uh, in its wake. And that's why we were setting up the conditions to have this very serious, uh, intense negotiation with the Russians, which I think was setting up in a pretty good spot uh, until, again, we, we, uh, we throw away all of our leverage by announcing we're leaving. Um, there's also very serious risk to Iraq. This is, of course, one-third of Syria in which thousands of foreign fighters and suicide bombers poured from Syria into Iraq uh, that we are now uh, announcing to the world that we are going to leave without having any plan uh, for who is going to take our place. Um, so 
again, I think the consequences are quite serious. That's why I would recommend uh, to the president to halt these orders, reassess the situation. Um, but short of that, I think we just have to face a, a very hard reality. I mean, you couldn't make it up, really. It just does sound very perplexing indeed for all the reasons that you state. Can I just ask you to give me your personal uh, uh, analysis, opinion of what role Secretary Mattis played? And I don't just mean as a former commander, as Secretary of Defense, but as somebody who, it has to be said, the rest of the world looked to as a salutary influence on a president who was not versed in military affairs or foreign affairs. Look, Secretary Mattis is uh, one of our greatest Americans. I, I had the honor to work very closely with him over the, these last two years, but also uh, many times previously, uh, really over the last decade. Uh, combat veteran, spent a lot of time in war zones. That is actually very important experience. Um, you want to have people who actually know what it's like on the ground, know what this is like, know what we're talking about. Um, so his voice in the room was just a, a critical uh, uh, kind of stabilizing uh, factor as the national security team uh, deliberated and made decisions. And um, when President Trump came in, you know, we did a, we did a strategic review of uh, the counter-ISIS campaign. And we looked at elements in which we could accelerate the campaign. And we put a number of decisions to the president. And the president made those decisions, and those were good decisions. Um, that, was a, that was a strategic review that was, was really run uh, by my office together with Secretary Mattis and Secretary Tillerson at the time. And I think it was actually done uh, quite professionally and thoroughly. And have you heard from America's allies and partners, particularly the ones who you've been talking to in the wake of this decision? There is concern about uh, where this is heading. And I think particularly our, our allies in Europe uh, that were prime targets for ISIS. And, you know, the attacks, again, the attacks in Paris left 130 civilians dead in the streets of Paris. Those attacks came directly from mm -hmm. Syria. They were planned in Raqqa. They were organized in Monbij. They sent a terrorist combat team out through Syria to infiltrate into Paris. Uh, the same thing with the Brussels airport attack. So these are very serious threats that were emanating from Syria. And these countries and capitals, all of whom have put their blood and treasure on the line as part of our coalition under the umbrella of American leadership, um, are extremely concerned about uh, the decision that was just made. And the fact that, again, we don't have a plan for what's coming. Um, it's one thing to say, look, we should leave Syria. Let's think of a plan. It's another thing to announce we're leaving Syria, and then to try to think of the plan later. Um, and that's what's going on now, and I think it is, it's increasing uh, the risk to our forces on the ground. It's increasing the risk to um, our, our partners who are under threat from, from ISIS. Um, you know, you've laid it out very succinctly, and you've sort of touched on the fact that, yes, of course, if we want to withdraw troops, but we should have a plan, not do it vice versa. But what do you say to the American people, to the president who ran on a promise of, bringing back forces. These wars have been going on since 2001 after 9-11. You know, they're the forever wars. People in America are fed up with them. Well, again, it's a great question. That was a, that was a drive, that was, it's obviously a driving uh, uh, influence within the Trump presidency. And President Obama also, of course, had that view. And that comes from the American people and the, uh, the experience um, of our country over the last decade. Uh, that is why, however, we designed the counter-ISIS campaign to address that. And again, this, this element of a very low cost, a very high impact campaign. Americans are not fighting in the streets of Syria, in Syrian cities and towns. Uh, Syrians are doing the fighting. Raqqa, which was the capital of ISIS, through which all, under which all these threats were being, uh, these, plots were, these plots were being hatched and launched, um, ISIS was taken down by Syrians without the loss of a single American life. So we designed this campaign actually to address that. And again, my head is spinning because I recall very, 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 very clearly um, so many in the national security uh, field and also Trump when he was running as campaigning were very, very critical of President Obama precipitously pulling out of Iraq. And what did that lead to? ISIS, the rise of ISIS. And then what did that lead to? Reinserting tens of thousands, if not, you know, more U.S. troops. I mean, th we've seen this movie before. A pre in the Middle East, two, two things, presence matters and credib credibility matters. So an American handshake has to matter and your presence on the ground matters. And that does not mean, again, that we were planning or we should have planned to stay in Syria forever, for 20 years. Um, it does mean that we should have presence on the ground to help us in a negotiation with uh, adversaries like Russia. And our presence on the ground helps at the table. And having been a diplomat at the table, you want to have that in the, 
on your back. Number one, the consistency of American foreign policy and the leadership behind you and presence on the ground. That is what a diplomat really needs to get things done. Uh, and we just pulled the plug on that. It's really very perplexing with very, very potentially dramatic consequences. Brett McGurk, former presidential envoy for Syria and ISIS. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Christian.